All right, so today's lesson, we're continuing on. Uh, we're sitting in with Jesus, who is instructing his disciples, and as they're sitting on the mountainside, and Jesus began to lay out where he is leading his new disciples and what they can expect. And ultimately, of course, he wants to lead them into their relationship with God, into a deeper relationship with God, where God becomes their very life. Remember, Jesus discipled these men, so they would go out, and their primary purpose was to go and make more disciples. And they could only do that out of the overflow of the relationship that they have with with God. So turn with me in your Bibles, and we're going to read a a pretty big section of Matthew chapter 6. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 18. I'll give you a minute or so to get there. Matthew chapter 6, and in starting at verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us us our debts as we forgive, uh, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive you your sins. When you fast, do not look sober, somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So here Jesus is, is focusing on, he's zeroing in on uh, three different aspects for, of giving, praying, and fasting. And, and of course these all flow, giving, giving, praying, and fasting all flow out of a relationship with God because of our love for him. So to the level of our giving and our praying and our fasting is the level of our intimacy with God. There these are expressions of a relationship, not the way into a relationship. So, so they're, they're born out of the relationship that, that we have, um, it's not how we get into it, but because of that relationship, because of what we've experienced, that's where they come from. And so remember, God has accepted us because how did we come? We came humbly by repentance and faith, and not what, nothing is based on what we did or what we had to bring or anything that we had to do, but But sadly, these religious leaders had turned uh, things around to, and they were really, what they were doing was drawing attention to themselves and and, and drawing it, and really it was drawing away from God. But here Jesus seeks to reclaim uh, reclaim them. Uh, First of all, uh, by giving us the heart uh, not for show. Giving Giving is of the heart not for show. So when we give, it's, it's not about making a spectacle. It's not about uh, 
coming off in a certain way. Praying is of the heart, not for show. And fasting is of the heart, not for show. It's not what you give or how you pray or, or when you fast, but it's, it's, it's motive behind the giving, the praying, and the fasting. It's about your intimacy with God. And so we'll zero in on prayer in, in, in 102 and come back to giving and fasting in, in a later stage of the teaching. But God's Word will reveal the following about prayer. And so here's the, here's the uh, points for today that we'll look at. Disciples communion with... Oh my goodness, we'll slow down here a bit. Just breathe. <laughs> Disciples commune with God, uh, commune with God in prayer to express honor, worship, submission, needs, forgiveness, dependency, and so on. And then, of course, secondly, Christ desires to engage with us personally through the study of His Word to aid our communion with God. Okay, so first off, so disciples communion with God in prayer to express honor, worship, submission, needs, forgiveness, and dependency. So let's go back to Matthew chapter 6, and let's dig into, into the different pieces here. Now, can somebody read verses 5 and 6 of Matthew 6 for me, please? 5 and 6 of chapter 6. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, so this is early, this is early on in Jesus' ministry. And so Jesus' ministry is happening in a very public setting, isn't it? And so here Jesus is expressing um, some very strong terms. Like when you pray, do not be like who? What's the word here? Hypocrites. Now, can you imagine? Everybody in the audience would have known who Jesus was talking about. He was speaking of the religious leaders. And these religious leaders, by and, by and large, were probably sitting in, the set, sitting in amongst the crowd. Can you imagine the shockwave that would have went through the audience as Jesus used these strong... Like, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Can you imagine the shock? These religious leaders were the ones that made all the rules, and yet Jesus calls them out. So why, why do you think Jesus would use such strong words? Why would Jesus use his words when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites? Like, why would, why would he come across so strong? What's he, seeking to, what's he seeking to reveal? Any thoughts? What's he wanting to reveal? Yeah. Because again, as Gary had already shared, praying is what's the intention, what's, what's God's intention behind prayer? Is communion. It's about, it's about relationship, isn't it? But what have are, what are the, what are these religious leaders done with it? Yeah, complete flip, right? Complete turn away from what God intended. And so God, Jesus was also seeking to draw that line in the sand as to who he accepts and who he rejects. And it wasn't these ones that were doing it for show. See, you need to realize that culturally, these religious leaders, when it talks about here, that when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love, uh, for they love to st uh, pray standing in the synagogues on the street corners, what they would do culturally is, is three times a day, they would be out standing in the street corners praying. And they would purposely pick the busiest time of day to they'd be pray, they would be standing out there praying. And when they would pray, they would use the longest words and the biggest words and the most flowery speech to draw attention to them. Hey, look at me. Look how religious I am. And it was all about them. But instead, what is Jesus calling his disciples to? Verse, verse 6, what's Jesus calling his disciples to? Not to do it out in, the, in front of everybody, but to do it how? Privately. To privately, right? And what, is, what, is, what does he promise? Then your father, what does it say there? What's he promise here? who sees what is done in secret, what will he do? He will reward you. Because again, in that, at the heart of the relationship. Keep going, Gary. So, um, continuing on, uh, Jesus continues to reclaim the, the true purpose of prayer. So let's read on in Matthew chapter 6, 7, and 8. Uh, so somebody uh, read verses 6, 7, and 8 for us. Sorry, actually, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. Uh, let's try that. <laughs> Father knows what you need before you even ask him. 
So that's interesting right at the end there. So if God knows what I need before I ask him, then, then why am I asking? Why, why bother pray, praying? What's the purpose? Is there any reason? Relationship, relationship right. For a deeper relationship. We talked about it earlier, that, that whole aspect of the communion. For a, you know, prayer is a deep communion with God where I tell him, you know, where we tell him, um, where I tell him what I know. This is, this is really cool. Where I tell him what I know he knows in order to get the perspec- his perspective on it. Isn't that interesting? We tell him what he already knows. Uh, praying is our, uh, aligning our ideas, our plans, and our attitudes, and our agendas with God's. That's, that's an aspect of humility coming out here. Prayer is confessing sin. Taking God's attitude towards it, not our own. Prayer is praising God for who He is and what He's done. Prayer is an expression of faith and our dependence on our bountiful provider for all of our needs. It's an incredible expression. This is why we pray. It's revealing that we are ultimately dependent on who? On God. Why? Because of who God is. Because God is eternal, He's all-powerful, He's self-existent, He's supreme, He's yet one yet trinity, He's faithful and changing, ultimate owner and ruler. This is who God is, this is the characteristics of who He is. And prayer is an expression of our faith and full dependence on the character of God, of the person of God. Isn't that absolutely incredible? What a, what a privilege that is ours to be able to pray. Uh, if we go on... I think we have this another. Is not, no, this is just this all in there, sorry. That's all in there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought we had another. No. Sorry, that's my, that's my bad. The reality is that end, endless babbling and vain repetitions and empty phrases, they reek of pride, don't they? And so as we come before God, looking at humility over here, this chart over here on the right-hand side, um, as we come by way of prayer, is really expressing humility, isn't it? It's expressing that, Lord God, you are good, loving and gracious. All that I need is found in you. Lord God, I belong to you alone as my sole owner and final ruler. Lord God, I need you to continuously lead and teach me. Lord God, I exist for you alone. And there's the heart of of prayer. There's the heart of communion is humility, this sense of dependency as we bow before him and say, God, we need you. And I think more and more I'm convinced that the humility is at the core of what it means to walk as a believer in Jesus Christ. Because again, recognizing that all that we have is because because of Him. See, communion with God is intimate, it's real, it's not fake. And what Jesus is wanting to elevate this, to to reclaim prayer, to bring it back to its original intention as 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 He designed it. Now notice, Jesus is seeking to help them so that they would understand the heart of it. Now let's go to verses 9 to 13 as Jesus continues on and lays out more as to what prayer is. Somebody read verses 9 to 13 for me, please. Bill, can you read that for me, please? Okay, so notice how he begins here. This, then, is how you should pray. So is what Jesus is saying here, is, this, is he giving the exact wording of how we're to pray every time we come to him? Is that what he's saying here? This, then, is how you should pray. So here's the formula. Follow these steps. Is that what he's saying to us here? How do we know that? You're shaking your head no. How do we know that? Because, again, what is prayer? What's at the heart of prayer? Yeah. What would, it be, what would it be like if I dressed my wife very regimented, very formal, every time we had a conversation, I began every conversation the exact same way? What kind of relationship would we have? It would be pretty stilted, wouldn't it? Very rigid. Yeah, very rigid. There wouldn't be freedom and relationship and, and expressing heart. And that's what Jesus is wanting to portray here. He's giving them components to pray. Now, as you read the Lord's Prayer, and this is often referenced as the the Lord's Prayer, God draws this in and creates a longing to commune with with Him. Like the the heart of it all. Our Father. Notice how He's saying here, Our Father in heaven, hallowed is Your name. There's an intimacy He's seeking to draw us into to go, go forward. 
See, this term father, as he's using it, he's using it as he originally intended its meaning to be. That one of intimacy, that one of integrity, deep caring, protection, and provision. See, now notice, notice the wording here that he uses. It's very, it's very powerful here. It's our father, personal. Now, as we look at this term, we got to be careful that we don't look at God through our set of glasses, how our human fathers have treated us, because that's not who God is often. Our human fathers, though they're imperfect, they loved us, but many times they made mistakes. God is our perfect father, and he is completely trustworthy. He is our father, and that's how he wants to, us to see him. And those are the first words that he uses to draw us into this conversation with him. Keep going. Okay, so there are six key components that uh, should be a part of our prayer. So as we looked at the Lord's Prayer, uh, well, it's, it's called the Lord's Prayer, but there are six key components that are in there. Uh, and, and so these define how we need to, need to approach Him. Get the little blurb out of there, and then we're all good to go. So as we start, and these, these are the keys, so uh, our Father in Heaven... So this is acknowledging, as, as, we, as we begin to pray, it's acknowledging God is Lord. He is creator, absolute and supreme. Um, over all peoples, we exist for him, and he is ours. So that's what, this is, this is the model. These are the, these are the distinct, um, what, what's the word we use there? Component of the prayer. And it's not about, it's not about uh, using the exact same thing, but these should be uh, the different components included in this prayer. And so as we go on, we're... I'm just to keep going. I'm out of point here. Uh, hallowed be your name. So honored and praised and holy is your name. There is worship in your prayer, lifting up the name of God, lifting him up as the one supreme uh, God. And, and, and again, going back to who God is and the characteristics of God, bringing up and worshiping. And then your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your will rule over all. Be accomplished in my life and in the, uh, in the nations abroad. We also long for his future rule. So these are, again, key components of, of the Lord's Prayer. And, as we, and then as we go on, the continuing on, so give us today our daily bread. And this is affirming that our, our entire dependency is on uh, a bountiful provider for all our needs. Provides for our food, our life, wisdom, strength, and so on. And gives us, uh, and God gives at each moment... Not in advance. Why? Why does he do that? Why does he choose to give at each moment? Not in advance. What does it do? What does that do? Keeps you in dependence. Keeps you dependent on God. Relying on God. Fully trusting in God and his character and who he is. Forgive us um, our debts, our sins, as we forgive, uh, as we have been forgiven uh, as we have forgiven others, sorry. So to the level that we forgive, God forgives us. Forgiveness is, is hard. So we pray, Father, empower us to forgive others as you have forgiven us. Isn't that incredible? Because it, the reality of it is, it is hard for us to forgive others. But not when God empowers us to be able to forgive others. So here, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It all <clears throat> uh, is also translated, don't let us yield to temptation. Saying, Lord, I can't, uh, I can't overcome sin, Satan, on my own. Please protect me. It's again, there's this, this full reliance on God, full dependence on God, because God, I can't overcome these. You have defeated sin, Satan, and death, but I can't overcome these. It's fully relying on who God is and His character. So you think about that. So as you come, come here and it begins this prayer, um, God, is, God is Lord, Creator, Absolute Owner. We exist for Him and He is ours. As we begin with that mindset, how does that draw us into prayer? 
How does this mindset of who, knowing who God is and this, our connection or relationship with Him, how does that draw us into prayer? How does that draw us into prayer? Is God for us? Or is He against us? Sorry? He's for us. He's relationship, right? That's the one thing that we've learned all the way through God's Word is that He pursues for relationship. He pursues in all of that. And as we come to prayer, is actually the overflow of that understanding that we have a God who's, who longs to hear from us, and there's that relationship. But then even the different components, we're still seeing the level of relationship that, they, that He's brought us into. It's on His terms, isn't it? We exist for Him. He's not our sugar daddy, that we have the genie that we just rub to get whatever we want. No, there's a humbling as we come before Him. Yes, He's for us. Yes, He desires relationship. Yes, He desires to meet our needs and to forgive. Absolutely. But it's on His terms, and it's how He works and how He goes forward. The, there's some, some translations will actually end this verse, a verse, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And different translations will include that. Um, I'm not sure where yours is at. See, truly prayer is deep communion with God, isn't it? It's a relationship. It's a reflection of, of what He has done and, and our understanding of that relationship. Through that, we express honor, don't we? We, we ascribe worth. God, you are incredible, as Gary has been talking about. We, it's, it's worship. It's, it's our submitting before him, recognizing our need for him. It's uh, recognizing and receiving forgiveness and dependency. But you know something? It's so intimate that uh, it's very, very sensitive to sin. Notice verses 14 and 15 of chapter 6. So let me read verses 14 and 15 to see how deeply intimate this conversation is with God and the terms he puts on it. So I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. So why would God be so strong here that if we refuse to forgive another, He won't forgive us? It's almost like if I'm, I have unforgiveness in my heart, there's a barrier that's put up in my communion with God. Why? Why would he do that? I thought he's relational. I thought he's desiring relationship. I thought he's desiring that we're going to come. So then why this barrier if there's unforgiveness in my heart towards another? Doesn't that seem harsh? What do you think? Yeah, fellowship is broken with, sorry, with who? Yeah, because if, if I'm out of sorts with John here, if there's out of sorts here, this relationship affects my relationship with God because John is created in, in his image. Remember, go back to Cain and Abel, back, back to the very beginning here, that when, when, Abel struck, or when Cain struck down Abel, who did Cain strike? God, because Abel was created how? In the image of God. And if I have unforgiveness in my heart towards John, it's a, it's a person, John is a person who's created in the image of God. And if I'm out of sorts here then guess what? That affects my relationship with God going forward. See, now, unforgiveness doesn't change my position with God, but it affects my fellowship with God, and we need to understand that. It's almost like unforgiveness puts up a barrier, puts up a fence, as it were, between me and, and, and the fellowship of God. And forgiveness, no matter how difficult, as we choose to forgive, it actually opens up the gate. It actually opens up the door, breaks down the fence, for deeper communion with God. And yes, forgiveness is difficult, especially when it's, when it's very deep and very painful at different points in our lives. But God is assuring us that if, guess what? If we recognize how much we've been forgiven, then He and His grace leads us to also to forgive others. God stands ready to enable us to obey, and that's who our God is, and understand the, the nature of that. So let's look at some definitions of of what godly forgiveness looks like. Um, here we have forgiveness is a choice, an act of the will, not a feeling. Do you believe that? Does that make sense to you? But often when there's, when, when there's hurt, there's so much emotion involved, isn't there? But God is actually, actually asking us to step over the emotion to recognize the truth. 
Because that's, that's exactly it. Be, and that's why we're saying here, it's, not, it's a choice, an act of the will, not based on, on, on that whole aspect of feeling, on that emotional side of it. Uh, absolutely. Forgiveness is based on the truth that God has forgiven us, not on what is fair. Isn't that interesting? We often look at that and, and, and we're realizing, well, that's not fair. They treated me unfairly. But forgiveness is based on the truth of what God has forgiven me, what God has forgiven us. That's what it's based on. It's not based on whether something is fair or not. Forgiveness may result in forgetting, but forgetting is never a means to forgiveness. Forgiveness is Holy Spirit empowered, not a legalistic or fleshly, grit your teeth response It's the result of humility. That's where it's born, in this part right here, in humility. It's not, it's not you know, oh, I'm just going to try hard to forgive this guy. You know, that's not what it's, it's not like, you know, grit your teeth and bear down. And it, It's the result of humility. It's, it's a response out of humility, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness is unconditional, from the heart, not conditional. Isn't that interesting? That's a good point. And we'll go to the next one. Forgiveness is holistic, canceling the entire debt. It's not selective or partial or just suppressing your anger, just hiding it. I will deal with it because I'm supposed to forgive, so that's how I will come across. And yet there's a barrier there. Because we haven't completely forgiven. We haven't done this, uh, this aspect of holistic uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness allows God to execute His judgment. Uh, sorry. Um, forgiveness allows God to execute His justice in His time and His way. Because He is just. Not taking justice into our own hands. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is complete. Resolving the anger and the, and the resentment by releasing the offenses and the offender and not keeping a record. That's godly forgiveness. Isn't that incredible? As we look at that, this is what godly forgiveness looks like. And so how do we do in that? How do I do in that? What is the reality of that? Wow. So let's go back to prayer. As we talked about... Um, disciples communion with God in prayer. So think about this. Prayer begins with the very character of God. How so? If this sense of communion, disciples commune with God in prayer, how does this all begin with the character, with the character of God? What is it about the character of God that this becomes a reality, that this is desire, this deep communion? Who is, who is our God that would desire deep communion with us? What's his character like? What motivates our God that this deep communion is possible and is desired? From the very beginning, who is our God? Absolutely. So as we know, as we know our God is loving, merciful, and gracious, as we know who our God is, that draws us into want to commune with Him because He desires, because of His character, God is love. What else, what other characteristics of God are actually behind and reinforce this deep communion with God in prayer? What is it about our God that draws that, that desires that? His jealousy? Yes. Absolutely, His jealousy, right? He's created us for himself, not for those other things. And so in, in a sense, that's why Jesus used such strong wording, right, for the religious leaders. You hypocrites, they're, li- they're missing out because God is jealous. What are the characteristics of God would desire this deep communion with him? Yeah. So do we understand that, that we have a God that's not distant? We have a God who pursues. We have a God who desires relationship. But then also think about that. We have a God who communicates, doesn't he? He didn't plop Adam and Eve down in this garden and just abandon them. What did God do? In the quiet of the, in the, in the cool of the afternoon, what did God do? He came and talked with them, walked and talked with them. And all the way through history, we have a God who communicates. 
And so as we understand who our God is, this reinforces, that's the impetus behind all of this, because we know who our, we know who our God is. See, God didn't have to be relational with mankind, did He? Like, He could have made us, from the very beginning, He could have made us as dumb as a rock. But He didn't. He created us in His image with a mind, emotions, and a will so that we could communicate with Him. And so He did that so that we would understand all the way through. So think about that through history. How has God sought to communicate? We talk about Adam and Eve. Down even with Cain. Remember, Cain is refusing to come God's way. But what does God do? God reaches out and pursues. At the flood, how many years did God give to the, to the people of Noah's day to, re, to respond? See, we have a God who seeks to communicate. See, God communicated directly through the angels and in dreams to, to whether to Noah or to Abraham. He was so personal that they didn't hesitate to do even the hard things. Like you think about, you think about Abraham, what God asked Abraham to do. See, Abram so knew the voice of his God that when his God asked him to sacrifice Isaac, that he responded in obedience. He knew who he was. God speaks directly to the heart of mankind um, through the Holy Spirit, convicting, revealing truth, etc. Uh, God came to mankind face to face in the person of Jesus Christ to perfectly, to personally commune with us. See, all that God desires, I think a really neat example, take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 33, a passage here that I think reveals God's heart, His desire for relationship and communion with Him. And this, is, this account is, takes place on Mount Sinai. Moses has gone up into the mountain, and he's standing there before God, and there's this relationship, there's this conversation that's happening here. Begin re reading at verse 13. Notice what it says here of chapter 33, Exodus. If you are pleased, now this is Moses speaking, if you are pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. Now Moses is the leader of, of how many? Two million people roughly. And so there's a sense and there's a relationship here, this communion. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go up with, with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me with, and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Like what incredible endearment intimacy in this relationship it continues uh, verse 18 then moses said now show me your glory and, and the lord said i will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you and i will proclaim my name the lord in your presence i will have mercy on whom i will have mercy and i will have compassion on whom i will have compassion but he said you cannot see my face for no for for, for no one may see me and live then the lord said there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the, in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face you must not see. Do we, do we get the sense of intimacy? Like this is Old Testament stuff here. Jesus hasn't even gone to the cross yet. There isn't, a, there isn't that intimate relationship of, of union and, and, born, and, and Moses as a born-again believer as, as we are as New Testament believers, but there's a level of intimacy here, intimacy here that God desires and is so passionate, so personal. Keep going, Gary. So as we pray, we come into the presence of, of God Almighty. That's what prayer is. We're coming into the very presence of Almighty God. Through prayer, we uh, express and our honor to Him. We worship. We submit. Uh, we, we bring Him our needs uh, we, for forgiveness, dependency. And to arri arrive at that level of communion, we must deal with unforgiveness. We have, to, we have to deal with that. We have to deal with that unforgiveness and that sin. Because we don't want to be like those hypocrites. We don't want to be uh, pretending that all is well and, and refusing to forgive. Because if we do, we're just going through the motions and, and there's, there's limited intimacy. Have you, ever, have you ever been with somebody? Have you ever experienced that and, and something has gone wrong and, and there's been a, 
uh, been something between you and somebody else and you ask for their forgiveness and, the, and they, they say they forgive you. And yet you always feel a little bit that there's something isn't quite 100%. And I've experienced that before and all of a sudden a little while later uh, 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 one of these people will, will come back up and, and say, you know what, I have totally forgiven you. And you realize, and all of a sudden you recognize that relationship has now been restored. You know, let, let's not be like those hypocrites and just say, yes, I forgive you because I'm supposed to. We need to find that forgiveness that, and, and it, that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. If, if we do, uh, you know, we're, we're just going to that limited intimacy. You see, because bitterness has many roots, and it's, and it's a cancer in the soul, and it, and, and it uh, really, bitterness is, is evidence of unforgiveness, that there's unforgiveness, there's sin there. We need to ask ourselves the following questions. Have I forgiven everyone? Do I hold a, a grudge or bitterness against anyone? Do I talk or belabor what others have done against me? See, if we want to enjoy this level of intimacy with God and all that He's provided, yes, the relationship there is with God, but if we want to enjoy this level of communion with Him, then we've got to deal with forgiveness. We've got to deal with bitterness. And that's the reality of what God's Word is communicating, isn't it? We have to realize that forgiveness is impossible on our own. Confess it to God, asking Him to give, give you the strength to do this, to do this and, and move through. Uh, and when it seems we can't forgive, then there's always the aspect of remember, go back to how much have I been forgiven myself. I, I think that starts to put things into perspective when I start to realize, and, it, and it's about humility. How much have I been forgiven? And once we recognize how much I for, I've been forgiven, then we realize and recognize, yes, I need to do my part as well. See, so just as by way of review, prayer is telling God what we know He knows to get to know it as He does. And God invites us into prayer at that level. Prayer is enjoying intimate conversation, fellowship with God. Prayer is simple, reverent, and unselfish. It's so real and so serious that it's not something that we play around with. It's not something that we're flippant with, like the Pharisees were. Um, prayer is, connects us with the voice of God that we may uh, readily obey, even in the hard things, and it's, it's the means that we have to deal with sin. See, this is the level of unity and harmony that Christ has brought us into. And prayer is not just some sort of afterthought of God. It's at the heart of that relationship. It kind of flows out of that relationship and causes that relationship to continue to grow. This, in, this intimacy begins in the present, continues to grow and get deeper as we step from this life into eternity when we can have face-to-face -face conversation with God Himself. And for all of eternity, we'll have unhindered communion with Him. There's no, there'll be no more sin, no more separation. But God invites us in in the present tense to begin enjoying that relationship now. And prayer is that vehicle. Disciples commune with God in prayer to express honor, worship, submission, needs, forgiveness, and, and dependency. And that's what God has invited us into uh, as, as his children. Any thoughts or comments on that? Any thoughts or comments? Thinking about forgiveness like that, thinking how much God has forgiven us is, is important to remember that. That's not even where we comes from to forgive. What's been done for us is more who God is. Mm. That's where the power comes from. Right. Just because somebody, I've, I've been forgiven lots doesn't mean I have the power to forgive someone else. It's right. It comes from God himself. Yeah. Yeah, it flows, out, it flows out of a right understanding of who he is. Mm -hmm. And he is, he is Lord and Master. Whether I feel like it or not, he's the one that says, I need to forgive my brother. And to, to the level, like we, we came by way of humble repentance and faith, didn't we? We continue walking in that humble repentance and faith going forward, recognizing who our God is, and I am not God. 
I exist for him, and it's, it's, um, his, his wishes are mine to obey. As soon as we say, I, I won't, there's pride and rebellion. Mm -hmm. yeah. And really we're setting ourselves up then above God, right? Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts or, or comments on this? I heard a story of a lady once that she had a box under her bed and every time anybody did anything bad to her, she wrote down a slip of paper and put it in her box. And, um, and night after night, she'd pull her box and she'd pull her slips of paper and she would be remembering. Like, what kind of life would that be like? Like, absolutely miserable, wouldn't it? But that's how she chose to live. But the reality is, many of us don't have our slips of paper in a box. We're holding onto those slips of paper and we play it over and over and over and over again. And that's not where God wants us to live, right? Well, you just recognize that the enemy is coming to us and would try to get us to do exactly that. I mean, he's also bombarding us with those thoughts. You know, why did you forgive? This isn't fair. Mm -hmm. You know, truly you were, you know, mistreated. And, and it's right that you get even. I mean, he comes with all kinds of lies. So we're not only fighting our own patterns, but we're fighting the, the lies of the enemy. Yes. Absolutely. And our, pre, our predisposition is towards pride, isn't it? Our, our, our nature is, is, poor, is, is poised to, to pride. And how dare they? And, um, but again, continue to remember. And that's, again, why prayer is so important. It's that continual cleansing, as it were. It's that continual coming before God to, to deal with keeping things small. And I remember amongst the Mangan, as we were there, you know, the, one of the most difficult things that was part of that we needed to do is that every day we needed to go and deal and shake hands with as many people in the village as we could. Because if I didn't shake hands with them today and there was something that got left, it was going to bite me tomorrow. And so by keeping short accounts with everybody, then it wasn't something big and explosive that was going to bite me later. And, um, but again, relationships are important, aren't they? And we need to understand that. So our second point is uh, Christ desires to engage with us personally through the study of his word to aid our communion with God. So the, the more that we know him, the deeper that we know him from his word, the deeper our communion will be with him. And that's why we need to understand, understand his word. And so we're using this... Um, this study guide here. So begin with prayer, asking God for wisdom, set your heart to engage with it. Initial study, digging deeper, and we're kind of walking through some of those pieces as we're going in application, and uh, then begin sharing the truth. So what we're going to do, take your Bibles and go with me to Matthew chapter 9, or Matthew chapter 6, excuse me, and verses 9 to 13, the Lord's Prayer. We're just going to kind of dig into that and just... Um, pull it apart and see what more truth we can pull out of it because, again, we're never going to fathom the depths of what God has given to us in His Word. So Matthew chapter 6, um, verses 9 to 13. And um, so, again, we need to have the different translations available. My NLT person walked away on me. And um, so if somebody can find up other translations, oh, um, that would be good too. But I'll read, it. I'll read it in the NIV first. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from the evil one. Okay, does somebody else have a different translation? Dan, I think you have NAS, NASB. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay. Does somebody have King James? Yes, please go ahead and read that, please. 
Yes, the 9 to 13. Um, Teresa, can you read Judy's Bible there? Grab her Bible there, and verses 9 to 13 of Matthew chapter 6, because that's the NLT. Is anybody else, well, she's finding that. And we also have a different translation? I've got the NLT on Okay, so then go ahead and read that, Dale, for us then, sorry. Uh, sorry, it was chapter 13, verse 13. No, chapter 6, verse 13. Verse 9 to 13. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you get it? Matthew, Matthew 6. 9 to 13. Does anybody else have a different translation while he's finding that? Here, I'll read the um, Amplified. Okay, please do. Pray, for, pray therefore like this. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed, kept holy, be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven, left, remitted, and let go of the debts and have given up resentment against our debtors. And lead, bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, NLT. NLT, uh, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name uh, be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today. Okay, so here we have the here we have the um, the king uh, the NIV. So this then is how you should pray: Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So the um, NLT is the purple. So it said so they kind of alternate. This then is how you should pray. They kind of put it: Pray like this. Um, the Amplified, pray then in this way. The King James is, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. So some alternates there. So then this part here, our Father in heaven, okay? Which art in heaven? Who is in heaven? Some alternates to there. Um, hallowed be your name. May your name be kept holy. Um, hallowed be thy name is another alternates there. So for your kingdom come, thy kingdom come, or may your kingdom come, come soon is some alternates there. Um, thy will be done, may your will be done, is alternates there, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today, give us this day our daily bread. Give us today the food that we need. And forgive us of our debts, forgive us our sins, as we have also forgiven those who are, forgiven our debtors, those who have sinned against us, letting go of both the wrong and the resentment. And lead us not, do not let us yield, um, to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one or from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. So how do some of these alternate translations start to kind of magnify the meaning or bring the meaning out for us? How does these alternates give out some of the meaning? What, what jumps out at you as you kind of begin seeing it from these alternate um, translations? But some of the meaning that kind of pops out at you. Any thoughts? I think one of the things is, is, is a sense of our Father, may your name be kept holy. And we don't usually use this word, hallowed be your name. May your name be kept holy. Anything else? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And I think that's probably a better translation of God's character because can God lead us into sin? No, because God is not. God is not that. He's not evil. You can't, he's whole, absolutely holy. Anything else stand out? Just a quick glance at the, as we look at the different translations. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. But I guess, but again, but but just compare those two together in the sense, forgive us our debts. Is there what is the connection between forgive us our debts, forgive our sins? What like there's a there's a nuance there. There's a level of meaning there that I think there's a connection. So what is the connection there? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Does it almost seem, does that, that word rescue seem to have a little bit more proactiveness to it, a little bit more involved in the sense of, of God's heart? Okay. Okay, so the next step is, okay, so because God's word is his story, we need to see um, how this reveals God. So how do we see God in this particular verse here? So we have our Father. Okay. How will it be your name? And then your kingdom come, your kingdom. Your kingdom. Your will. Your it, will be done. Mm-hmm. On earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's kind of implied there. Okay, so what character, what, do we miss any, any markings of God? Okay, so what characteristics of God do we see here? Looking at our God chart over there, we've kind of simplified it. Eternal, all-powerful, self-existent, supreme, one yet trinity, faithful, unchanging, ultimate owner, ruler, source, sustainer of all life. What characteristics of God do we see in this verse? Forgive sins. sins. Okay, so what characteristic of God would that be? Mercy, maybe? Grace, yeah? Mm -hmm. Love, yeah, absolutely. But even forgive sins, and that will actually show his, his, that he's supreme too, right? Because he is that, that judge, uh, that uh, supreme. Also absolute yeah, absolute holiness. Because really that's at the heart of all of this, isn't it? Okay, what other characteristics of God do we see? So supreme ruler protecting us. Provider. Provider, yep. Would it be worth putting on soul provider? Like our true provider? What are the characteristics of God do we see? What does this do right here? Is that a characteristic? Oh, our Father. What characteristic of God do we see that in our Father? Relationship. Yeah, relationship, yep. Pursues relationship. Yeah, yeah, he's our father, and there's security there. Yeah. Any other characteristics of God? Okay, here's a question. As we, as we start listing out these characteristics of God here, how does that shed light on this particular verse? As we just look at it through the lens of God's character, how does that shed light on the meaning of this verse? Does it actually magnify the intimacy here in this, in what we're invited into? Because who's the one, who's the one, who's the one asking us to, to converse or commune with him at this level? Yeah, God himself. And this one who's merciful, this one who is supreme, this one who's holy, ruler, provider, relational, that's security. This is the one who's inviting us in. So what kind of meaning does that carry or, or bring out in this particular verse? As we understand it's God, that who the one is is inviting. Okay. 
Right. All white and it looks good. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what he's leading us into is good, isn't it? Any other thoughts on that? As we understand who, this, who our God is that's inviting us in, how does that bring out the meaning of this verse? Or what meaning does that shed on this? Or light does that shed on this? Any thoughts? This is not just a, a second guess thing here, is it? It's very, it's very intimate. Okay, let's keep going on. So notice any words that are strong or repeated. So as we look at that, I don't know if you have a different color of marker, what words would be strong or repeated in this particular verse? How you should treat. Okay, how so? This is how you should treat in this pattern. Or, you know, each, each one starts off like this. This is them, how I want you to pray. Right. So there's an, invi- there's an invitation there. This is how you should pray then, okay? Yeah? Any other words that have some, that are strength or repeated in this? How many times do we see your name, your kingdom, your will um, coming, coming through there? And there's, a, there's a repetition there, right? So what, because again, it being repeated, by it being repeated there three times, how does, what, what is God wanting to communicate to us? Because these words are there. They have meaning. They have purpose. Any thoughts? Is this about us? Is this about our agenda? Is this about our purposes? Yes, yeah, back to our Father, isn't it? Is there any other words that are strong or repeated that kind of stand out? Forgive. Mm-hmm. Why is that strong? Because we don't like that word, do we? Okay, so let's go. Let's go to. Let's go to the next part. Let's write out some questions: who, when, where, what, why, how questions. Um, and again, we're not going to answer them necessarily right now. But let's start asking some questions about these particular verses, and um, and just kind of list them out there for us. Why should we pray? Any other questions? What do you think? Who's instructing? Yeah, who's instructing? Who's inviting? Any other questions? What do you think? It's in the verse, but how? Yeah, how do we how do we pray? Mm-hmm. What does it mean your kingdom come? What is that kingdom? And why is that, imp- why is that important to pray? How is his will going to be done if he's in heaven? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And why is it important that his will would be done? I thought he's sovereign. I thought he's supreme. And why is God asking us to pray about it? If he's absolute, like why does we have to pray that his will will be done? Isn't his will going to be done anyway? Why does he want it done on earth as well? Yeah, why does he want it done on earth? You getting all this, Gary? Oh, absolutely Good not. job. Yeah, good job. It's a good thing I you're writing. I said not. <laughs> not? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, you had one that I totally forgot that didn't catch. How can his will be done if he's in heaven? <laughs> Any others? We want to make sure we get our, wor- our money's worth out of Gary here as he's writing. So, Any other questions? Where does our debt come from? Mm-hmm. What is the debt? <coughs> yep. What is what is temptation? Mm-hmm. Who's the evil one? Mm-hmm. 
Any other questions? And why does he call us to, de- to pray for deliverance? I thought, I thought we are secure there. I thought he's protecting. What's at the heart of that? Yeah. 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 Isn't that true, though, hey? <laughs> Yeah. What does hallowed mean? Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Why, why does he distinguish our Father in heaven? Like, what's, what's the importance of that designation? Why wouldn't it just be our Father? It's, he's everywhere present. So why is it our Father in heaven? <laughs> yeah, what kingdom? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so let's go let's go to step four and so step four dig deeper so let's read the passage in different translations and or languages again and uh, just to kind of pull out the meaning and actually if some of you know or are able to read another language it's actually helpful to study reading another language because there's a nuance that comes out in another language not necessarily in english okay so the niv again um this then is how you should pray our father in heaven Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Okay, NASB, Dan. I pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so we have a um, different translation. King James, I think, is back in the back there. Mrs. Braun? Mm-hmm. Yeah, verse 9 to 13. NLT. Do you have that yet, Dale, or do you? Oh, sorry, I'm on Orthodox Jewish Bible here. Mm. Uh, I can help you with that. Or somebody else a different translation yet again? Here's the Amplified again. Okay. Pray for, pray there for like this our father who is in heaven hallowed kept holy be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven left left remitted and let go of the debts and have given up resentment against our debtors and lead bring us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Did you get an LT? Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, uh, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins. As we, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. 
Okay, so here's the context. Let's look at the big context of the, of the, of the Gospel of Matthew and let's see how that how she sheds light on here um, as the Holy Spirit is leading Matthew to write it. So the first Gospel presents Jesus as the Christ, Israel's Messianic King. Jesus' genealogy, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, authority, and power emphasized as his messianic, his de- coming as a deliverer credentials. In spite of his unique words and works, gradually mounting opposition culminates in his crucifixion, but the king left an empty tomb and will come again. So the book of Matthew has this idea of kingship, this idea of ruling and reigning. So how does that overall context shed light on Matthew 6, 9-13? How does that shed light on this particular verse? What comes out? What kinds of terms does he use that kind of lines up with that? Yes, like think about that. Okay, so you have this idea, your kingdom come. So that kingdom is tied to what? His messianic king, the king that's coming to rule and to reign. And so that that's, that's how actually gives more meaning there, Right? Is there any other sense that comes through this verse that that understanding presents Jesus as the Christ, Israel's deliverer king, the one that was promised through David, Jesus' genealogy, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy, his authority and power emphasizes that he is that deliverer king. So how does that shed light on this particular verse? Any other pieces besides just the kingdom? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And so, how thankful are we that we have a God who's come to rule and to set us free? So again, so thinking, thinking of this God that's come as this pursuer, this, this one who's come to rule and to reign, this is the one who invites us into this communion with Him. He's not a distant king. He's not somebody that's just off there absent or, or not caring or uh, un- uncaring for all. This is one who invites us in. So are we getting a sense through this verse of what kind of king he is? Very personal, right? Desiring intimacy. Very, like, give us, our, give us today our daily bread. Like, write down what I'm going to eat today. This, we have a king who is that intimately involved. Any other thoughts on that? The next part is, is to look at some of the chapter, some of the, verses, some of the verses around it. And so if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, we have the Beatitudes. This reveals to Jesus' disciples how they should live and minister as his disciples. Okay, so this is the immediate context around Matthew chapter 6. And so he's, blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. So as we look at the Beatitudes, the immediate context, how does that shed light on these verses? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. What kind of light does that shed on this verse? Any thoughts? Any thoughts on that? We have a king who's inviting us in, right? Matthew, we have Matthew 5, 13 to 16. Disciples are to live as salt and light. Does that shed any light on this particular verse in, in, in chapter 6, verses 9 to 13? Yeah. yeah, this is how you stand out as salt and light. By forgiving, right? Desiring His will to come. Um, absolutely. Then you have verses of chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Jesus has come to fulfill the law. And then in uh, chapter 5, 21 to 30, Jesus reveals the heart of obedience is, is, um, is required. Um, and it talks about those different pieces there, settle those quickly. Um, do not murder, he talks about. Anybody that uh, says that uh, gets angry as brother, then is subject to judgment. Um, And then you have chapter, verses 27 to, to 30 talking about adultery. Um, looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery. Does that shed any light on this verse?
Again, this is our king speaking, isn't it? And so it kind of gives some of that relevance. And then we have um, got divorce, you got oaths, you got eye for an eye. Um, end of chapter 5, you got love your enemies. And then giving to your needy, pray, um, giving, to your, giving to your needy. Those, that's the immediate context around this particular verse. Okay, application. Let's go to that. Let's just spend some few minutes on the application. What do we pull out of this? Other than maybe we've seen already. Sense any rub? Do you feel any kind of sense that it's like, ah, this is kind of stepping on my toes? Is God asking us to do something here or that we need to respond to? Because he begins this with our Father in heaven. How to, like, keep, may your name be kept holy. Yeah. Because it's almost like the first half of the whole verse, or first, like our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then at this point here, I could give us our daily bread, but this is our needs only start here. All of this worship is, is the first half of the, of the verse. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The need is not a, that's nothing for him to provide. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else stand out? That word give is just an interesting word. Because it's almost like here you talk of the sovereign God and then you're saying, Give us today our daily bread. Most of us when we pray, it's almost like we try and blackmail God to so that we can get what we want. You know how we often pray? <laughs> You appreciate the child coming and saying, give me a you will never be. So, so here is the word. In the context of worship, you know, um, in the context of worship and our dependence on God, it's really saying, God, I'm dependent. Unless you give, if you're the giver, uh, there's no way I can survive. Yeah. Everything that I have, you give. Mm -hmm. So that context and that sense of the earlier part of the verse, uh, that takes that heart piece away that Dan was talking about. Mm -hmm. Because we're, and, and, and yeah, absolutely, and, it, and it's talking about, here, here we're starting off, your kingdom come, your will be done. And, and then it goes to give us, you know, that, then, but it's speaking of all that is in your will, all that is in your character, uh, it seems to be coming out there. Awesome. Any other thoughts? Chapter 5, verse 20. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. He's trying to show us all these really bad, but these things are pretty close to it. Amen. Kira, you want to do the conclusion? Yeah. 
I was just thinking back to, as we've been talking a little bit about that, the whole aspect of give. What did Moses ask? What was the ask that Moses uh, asked when he was a- asking God in that, in that portion of Scripture in Exodus 3.13 to 23 that we read earlier? Um, uh, where does it say that? God, show me your glory. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, then Moses says, now, in my translation it says, now show me your glory. Isn't that interesting? Isn't, isn't that the same? Isn't that almost a give me? Isn't it, this almost a, and now show me your glory? Who is, who is Moses to show his glory? And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. Does it have more to do with the hard attitude in all of this, the recognition, and, and again, we've talked a little bit about that, of who God is and his character and, and knowing and understanding because of that intimate relationship. And then God honors that. It's, it's not so much of a, uh, of a give me because I'm undeserving. It's more of a give me because you're a, a gracious God. Um, yeah, let's go wrap up in the conclusion. Sorry, I've got to go back down to my notes here. And so we've been, uh, we've been just going through... Um, Walking with the disciples as Jesus has, has been laying the, the core value uh, of a disciple, of what it is to be a disciple. And what he shares is, is absolutely radical. It's totally different. The first disciples, uh, much of their worship was more about reli- re- religion rather than relationship. It was about doing performance rather than, uh, and rules and regulations, doing the right thing. And now Christ was beginning to reset their hearts from, he was, he was going from the law to liberty. From bondage to bounty, from failure to freedom. These are, these are totally opposites. From performance to acceptance, from legalism to grace, from the external to the internal. And so can you imagine the, the, you know, the reorientation that's beginning in their lives? This is all new. This is all radically different. Christ was about to change everything for all of life. And if we're honest, our lives have been, uh, really, our lives have been about performance as well. And, and you think of it, a lot of times when, you know, in aspect of, the aspect of friends or friendship or relationships, you know, we, we often perform. We, we have nice stuff. Be, try to be the life of the party. You know, know the right people. You have to know the right people, the right things. Uh, we try to get ahead at work. You, must, you have to perform better than anyone else or... Else we need to, you know, you have to schmooze the right people. You have to know who, who's who. And, you know, you don't need to talk to them because they, they really don't have any influence. And so we're trying to impress. We're, we have that same attitude. To get, in head, to get ahead in sports a lot of times, it's about performance. Score, score the most points, the most goals. And what happens is that we begin to believe that God accepts us based on how, what we do, how we perform, how we're acting. We believe that God smiles and blesses us the more we do for him as it is to perform. Like John was saying earlier, uh, I spent two weeks at camp, and now I'm good for a bit. Or, you know, you owe me in a sense. We, we don't want to outrightly say that, but, but in a sense, there's that mentality going on. Well, we're so wrong. We are fully and finally uh, accepted in Christ. We don't have to perform. He accepts us as we are who we are. Christ is, is, he's also resetting our hearts from the whole aspect of law to liberty, from bondage to bounty, failure to freedom, performance to acceptance, legalism to grace, and externals to internals. Truly, he's leading us into the deeper relationship uh, he created, created us for. He becomes, he becomes our very life. And let's go all the way with him, regardless of the cost or how uncomfortable we might feel along the way. Because it's absolutely worth it. 